Welcome everybody to Smart Business, Small Business, an SBA speaker session. Uh, and this is coinciding with Small Business Week, which is organized by the Business Development Bank of Canada. My name is Glenn Drexage, and I'm here on behalf of UBC Library and the Irving K. Barber Learning Centre. I want to thank everyone who's here attending this event. Your support's really invaluable to us and what we're trying to do with this program. And I just want to talk a few minutes about the Small Business Accelerator program, uh, which is presenting tonight's event. It's uh, also known as the SBA. It was formally launched in November 2010 as an initiative of the Irving K. Barber Learning Centre. And briefly, it's a program that's curated by business librarians. It provides access to industry-specific resources and information for entrepreneurs and small businesses throughout the province. It's a gateway to business information, education, and assistance that's current and trustworthy. Aliyah McCauley, who's uh, sitting in front here, our community engagement librarian, she uh, would be happy to speak with you more about the program, as would myself. And I also encourage you to visit the website at uh, SB, right here, www.sba-bc.ca. So just a little bit about tonight's program. Uh, I'm gonna introduce each speaker as they come up. Uh, they'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll turn it over for a uh, question and answer session that can run about roughly about 20 minutes or so too. We'll just play it by ear. Uh, we are recording tonight's event and it will be archived uh, on the SBA site in the near future. And we'll also uh, be taking some photos uh, throughout the event. So if there's anyone here who does not want to be featured in photos, please just let us know. Um, and we'll hold the uh, networking reception afterwards. And uh, that'll allow for mingling and dialogue and sharing of ideas and so on. So without further ado, I'm just going to introduce our first speaker, Laurel Douglas. Uh, Laurel's career path has been unconventional. She was educated in Canada, Germany and France. And the first half of her career was spent in the male-dominated financial services and telecommunications industries in Toronto, Paris, Frankfurt and London. She settled in BC in 1994 and has since become a champion for the economic empowerment of women provincially and nationally. Since 2004, Laurel has been CEO of the Women's Enterprise Centre. Under her leadership, the centre has become the go-to place for women in BC who are starting, purchasing or growing their businesses. The centre has provided more than $36 million in direct and leveraged financing which has generated over a billion dollars in economic activity and almost 1,500 jobs in BC. In addition, the organization has provided training for more than 15,000 women business owners throughout the province. Laurel and her team are sought out across BC, Canada, and internationally for their expertise in women's entrepreneurship, programming, and training. Laurel's received many awards, the most recent one being the 2011 TIAW World of Difference 100 Award. And that recognizes women whose efforts have advanced the economic empowerment of women locally, regionally, and worldwide. And tonight, she's going to give an overview of the small business sector in BC and talk about what makes an entrepreneur and why it's an increasingly popular career choice. Please join me in welcoming Laurel. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak with you tonight on the topic of entrepreneurship, which is a topic I'm very uh, keen about, and the small business sector in BC. So what I plan to do uh, this evening is talk about four um, different things um, myself, uh, just briefly, because you already got the introduction from Glenn. I don't need to uh, spend much time on that. Um, then what is entrepreneurship? Uh, the, a little bit about the small business sector in BC and then um, I thought I wasn't sure how many students versus business owners there'd be in the crowd so I thought I'd touch on uh, ways you could figure out whether entrepreneurship is the right choice for you so before I start I'd just like to know how many people here own their own business so a number of you so uh, congratulations I know you work hard uh, in what you do for sure um, so, Glenn gave a lot of the information about my background. I did grow up in southwestern Ontario. I did my undergrad degree there. And uh, um, just to round out the introduction, I spent about 12 years in the private sector and then switched to economic development in the mid-90s. Um, and uh, I consider myself to be an entrepreneur. And I'll tell you more about that later. 
my education uh, involved a business degree, an undergrad degree in business, and then uh, after working for a few years in Toronto, I, I moved to France to do my MBA at INSEAD, which is uh, um, a well-known business school in Europe. Um, there were about 35 different nationalities in my class, and uh, um, really I, noted, I noticed early on in life that I had a, a strong business orientation. Uh, both my parents, all three of my brothers, both sets of grandparents and their parents and all my uncles were all small business owners. So that's a really important aspect of entrepreneurs. Uh, often it's in their blood, it's in their families. They know what it's like uh, to own your own business and have the benefits of it. Um, Glenn touched on my work experience, finance, telecom. Um, and, uh, and that really helped round out uh, my background so that I could do what I do now. Uh, I think he's mentioned where I lived. I've lived in a lot of different places. And then suddenly I moved to Nelson, BC in 1994 and uh, took a, a course in community economic development at SFU uh, because I wanted to take my business background and help apply it to, uh, to, to BC where I had chosen to live. And, uh, you know, Alcatel, where I'd been the manager of strategic planning and ran their strategic planning activities in the 22 countries where they had operations, you know, they had more employees than the entire Kootenai region has uh, is residents, so it was definitely a big switch. Um, and as I said, I'm an entrepreneur now, at least I consider myself one. I'm a social entrepreneur, um, and I believe I have a great job. I uh, run a commercial lending operation, a post-secondary training institution, and a management consultancy. That's basically what I do. Um, our clients are women business owners. 35% um, of the small businesses in BC are owned by women. And um, we provide them loans, training, business advisory services, and mentoring. And uh, Glenn mentioned some of the results. Um, we probably provide about 2,000 advisory service appointments a year um, out of our offices in Kelowna, Vancouver, and Victoria. Uh, we have about 1,000 training and mentoring clients a year, and uh, we give out between one and a half and two million dollars in loans per year. The average loan size is around 50 to 60 thousand dollars. So one of the really important um, features about our activities and the things that I, one of the things that make me feel really good about our organization is the fact that after five years, um, only 35% of the small businesses in BC are still in operation. However, among our loan clients, 75% are still in operation after five years. So we're definitely adding value. And you'll notice in the slides to come, um, I have photos of women business owners, I have photos of other people too, but all the women business owners you'll see are real loan clients of ours who own businesses in BC and their businesses are in manufacturing, retail and sales, uh, sorry, services. And it, so it's always nice to put a, uh, you know, to see some real people in, and this is one of them. So I'm going to move on to the next part of my presentation, which is about entrepreneurship. So this is a definition of entrepreneurship, of an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, really entrepreneurship is much more than this. According to some, entrepreneurship is a way of life. Some people really romanticize entrepreneurship, calling it a powerful force deep down inside, driving you to achieve your dreams despite dubious odds and the doubts of others. But it's really true. You know, you open a small business and people are going to doubt you and uh, question what you're doing. Um, there is really nothing like that excitement of starting something from scratch and watching it grow into a big en enterprise, but uh, I can't stress more strongly uh, how determined you have to be to do so, and I'm sure we'll hear about uh, that determination from the other speakers as well. Um, only one in six million high-tech businesses uh, business ideas become an IPO, so only one in six um, million. Venture capitalists fund fewer than 1% of the business plans they receive. And uh, the founding CEOs of high-tech firms typically own less than 4% of their company after an IPO. So there's a lot of odds that you have to, um, to get over. So what makes people want to go into this field? Um, to, to give up a steady paycheck in many cases and put themselves on the line. So they want to be their own boss, they want to set their own hours and have independence, they want to make money, and they want the challenge and satisfaction of seeing their accomplishments uh, um, to, uh, 
to fruition. But for the tech entrepreneur, it may also be a yearning to create something novel and useful. Um, they often have risk-taking orientations in their personality. They desire freedom, and they have a leadership orientation. So you may know some business owners if you're not one yourself, and you may know of other reasons why a, 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 someone would be motivated to become an entrepreneur. Um, so what are the traits they, they need to have? What, what makes them successful? What, what even is success? And uh, from working with women business owners for the last seven, seven years after having worked for almost 20 years with tech uh, on, uh, business, business people, there, there are really different motivations or, or definitions of success. Um, but they're usually pretty driven and, uh, and action-oriented. So, we all know who he is. Uh, Steve Jobs of Apple, a very successful entrepreneur whose recent passing caused Newsweek to actually publish an entire issue about him, which had absolutely no ads in it. Um, for the tech entrepreneur, it, um, you know, like Steve Jobs, he had other traits and personality attributes which made him successful. Creativity, originality, the ability to think outside the box. He couldn't really fit into a conventional organization, so he kind of had to create his own. So Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. What do you think helped this young man, who was born the year after I graduated from university and now has a personal net worth of $17.5 billion, become so successful? Well, on uh, Zuckerberg's Facebook page, he lists his personal interests as openness, making things that help people connect and share what's important to them, revolutions, information flow, minimalism. It turns out one of his traits was the ability to identify a market need and create a solution which they would want to use. Does anybody know who this is? Arlene Dickinson of Venture Communications. Most of you probably know her from the Dragon's Den. Uh, Canadian woman, she's been um, the owner of Venture Communications uh, since 1998. And uh, during her tenure with the company, um, she has taken that firm from being a local company to one of Canada's largest independent marketing firms. Um, and she's been on Dragon's Den since its second season. So what is it about Arlene's personality that helps her as a business owner? She uh, embodies many of the other qualities of a successful entrepreneur. She has guts. How else could a single mother of four uh, have the guts to find the financing to buy her business? She has confidence, she's hardworking, high energy, and she cares about others both in her organization and in her community. She volunteers for a lot of different causes. Um, and um, interestingly, in her office, she has a 50s-style kitchen table where staff sit around and have beers and cheers every Thursday to celebrate their success, which is another important thing about uh, being an entrepreneur. Can anybody name this business? Sorry? Pardon? Club Penguin, that's right. Um, I'm very familiar with it because I have two kids who uh, basically were the third and fourth users, I think. Um, has anyone ever heard of Lane Merrifield or Dave Crisco or Lance Preby? They started Club Penguin here in Kelowna in 2005. And, um, and they really, they, were, they had another driver. They wanted to make sure they could find a, a safe site for their kids to play on on the internet. So um, they had a need that they tried to fill themselves. So those are some of the traits that, uh, that uh, people need to have to, to run a business. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are hard about owning your own business. There's a lot of uncertainty, uh, there's, you know, you don't get paid sick days, uh, you have to have a lot of self-discipline, you have to make all the decisions, especially at the beginning, which is a real struggle for some people who come from the, um, you know, being employed and having just a slice of the action to deal with or to be in charge of. And you need strong business skills, and most of you here either are studying business or have studied business in some way, shape or form. So. Um, that's a really good sign for your success. So there's a number of skills you need to run a business as well, um, because entrepreneurs must ju juggle several uh, key roles in their business. There's three key 
skills that um, Michael Gerber talks about in his uh, extremely good book, The E-Myth Revisited, which I would highly recommend any business owner read if they don't already know it. Uh, the first thing you need to do is be good at the basic work of your, your business and be the doer. But you can't just be the doer. You have to know how to manage your business. You have to know the systems, the procedures, making the things that make sure the bills are paid on time and your payroll is met. That's the manager. But if you stop at just being the doer and the manager, you still won't be guaranteed a successful business. You have to also be the strategist. You have to be able to create and provide the vision for the future of your business. And another important skill is leadership. And uh, even if you don't have employees, you need to demonstrate leadership skills in many areas of your, of your business, in negotiations and uh, with clients and suppliers and so on. Um, I won't go into that. I'm sure you've done a lot of work on leadership in various places. And if not, you now you just need to know that you have to find more about, out about it if you haven't yet. But there's some functional skills uh, that you need. You need to make sure you understand the basics of marketing, financial planning, business strategy. You need to understand human behavior so you can motivate your employees and your customers. You need to be good at seeing trends and finding things out. Um, but soft skills are also important. Negotiation, persuasion, presentation, communication. So overall, an ongoing orientation towards continuous learning is really important. And I think being here tonight shows that you're already in that, uh, in that mode. But not everybody is a gazelle. And uh, so you can't see this very well, so I'll tell you what's on it. It's the uh, little screenshot of the, uh, the um, Profit 200 fastest growing business in 2010. I couldn't believe it when I found out that the fastest growing business in Canada in 2010 was the company that makes Muzak the in-store music that you hear when you wander through malls. So, yep. So, you know, there's businesses in all of shapes and forms, and there are different types of entrepreneurs. Not everybody will be a gazelle and make it to the Profit 200 list. Um, as far as I'm, uh, as I'm concerned, there's three main types of business owners. There's the necessity business owner, the lifestyle entrepreneur, and the classic entrepreneur, or the gazelle. So the necessity business owner has basically uh, made a job for himself. You know, be, uh, you know, they might have lost their job and they need in income, so they've created their own job. The lifestyle entrepreneur makes up about 70% of all the small business owners in BC. That's the person who doesn't want to grow too big because they don't want it to infringe on their skiing time, their time with their family, whatever else. So, you know, it's arguable how, what percentage of total entrepreneurs are really classic uh, entrepreneurs, probably between 10 and 20 percent of the total. But from my point of view, involved with supporting business development in, um, in, this, in BC, uh, they're all important for us because they all generate economic activity. So that leads me to talk a little bit more about the small business sector in BC. Um, BC is a very entrepreneurial province. Um, it has 10% of Canada's population, but over 15.5% of its small businesses, according to Industry Canada's uh, Small Business Quarterly from August of 2011. So, of course, necessity is the mother of invention. We've all moved here. Um, th there aren't a lot of corporate head offices, so we don't have a lot of choice. Um, and many people move here for lifestyle reasons, which may explain some of the large proportion of lifestyle entrepreneurs here. We also attract independent-minded people who uh, want freedom and the uh, ability to express their creativity. Every year, BC Stats puts out a publication during Small Business Week in partnership with uh, Western Economic Diversification Canada, which provides us with our funding, called the Small Business Profile. It just came out this week, so I'm, uh, I look through it to see what exciting uh, new trends um, there were. Basically, there aren't really any exciting new trends, so I'll just tell you the old boring trends. Um, BC has about 392,000 small businesses right now, which is 98% of the total businesses in BC, and the second highest rate of small business ownership in the country. Uh, we have 86 small businesses per 1,000 people in BC. That's pretty high. Over 56% of those businesses are self-employed without paid help. 
but we still call them small businesses. Um, this ranks BC um, also number two in terms of uh, small business uh, employment as a percentage of the total private sector employees. Um, the only one which had a higher um, rate of, of, was PEI, which I don't believe counts because it only has 100,000 100, people in the entire province. So the small business sector employs over a million people in BC, which is over a half of all the private sector employment. Uh, but the picture isn't all rosy. The, the average self-employed worker works longer days on average, between two and five hours longer than his uh, employed counterpart. Um, and so I compared this year's small business profile to five years ago, and um, there's some interesting trends um, in, in that exercise. Um, typically, when times are bad, the number of small businesses goes up. And when the economy gets better, the number of small businesses go down. People lose their job, they have to do something, so they start a business. Uh, that has been true in the last five years. There are almost 8% more small businesses today than there were in 2005. However, the bad news is that the number of em people employed by the small business sector has only increased by 2.8%. So, meanwhile, the number of large businesses has gone down by 14% between 05 and 2010, uh, except that their employment has gone up considerably more than the small business sector's employment has gone up. So there's been a consolidation in the large businesses. Um, so um, the growth sectors between 2007 and 2010 um, were uh, services and high tech. They each grew about between three and four percent. and um, manufacturing declined by about 6% in BC. Regionally, those with the urban centers, those regions of BC with urban centers grew while the Kootenays, North Coast and Nechaco and Northeast declined in terms of the number of small businesses since 2007. And that makes sense too because they were supporting the employees in the large employers which went down uh, in number up there. So in August, um, we held an event in Vancouver um, and hosted the head researcher for the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, which is the largest small business association in BC. It has about, well, in Canada actually, it has about 108,000 members across the country and about 10,000 members here in BC. And they study uh, business confidence and they poll their members on their main issues and, and challenges uh, on an ongoing basis. So in August, the main uh, business constraints were insufficient domestic demand, d domestic demand, a shortage of skilled labor, and management and time constraints, and a shortage of working capital in that order. Their main cost concerns were energy, taxes, insurance, and wages. And, but their business confidence was high, and it had rebounded by 2010 to similar levels that were seen between 2001 and 2007. So I'd be curious if you ever have a chance to go on the CFIB website to uh, see if that's changing now as a result of the last couple months that have uh, in between. So in my presentation this evening, I wanted to give you a sense of who I am, what entrepreneurship is, both in terms of motivations, the skills, and, uh, and then also give you an overview of the small business sector in BC. Uh, so you could get a sense of how important small business owners and entrepreneurs are to our economy. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is the role that demographics play in the evolution of the small business sector. So as the baby boomers age and retire, they will want an exit strategy from their business. They'll need somebody to take it over for them so they can cash out. And in certain sectors, such as agriculture, the expectation has historically been that um, they'll pass the business down to the next generation, but that's no longer true. This is one of the most difficult decisions entrepreneurs have to make. What will they do with their business when they're ready to leave it? And I have some startling statistics. In, uh, in a few years ago, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a study of uh, uh, over 500 businesses and 45% um, of them said they didn't have succession plans. In uh, the CFIB did a study a few years ago as well, and they, their business owners reported that within 10 years, three quarters of their members wanted to exit their business, and within 15 years, 
86% of them wanted to exit their business, but less than half of them had a succession plan. And whether they could even execute that succession plan is another question because um, unless we encourage more and more people to start thinking about becoming a business owner, there just won't be the number of people there to, to take over those businesses and provide the products and services that we've gotten quite used to, to, uh, to benefiting from. So, um, to close, I'd just like to uh, say that if you are a small business or you're thinking of, it, uh, of uh, starting one, there's lots of resources out, out there for you. And the UBC Small Business Accelerator is one great example. We've been working with them since uh, the month they started because we know how important a resource it is. Uh, in fact, we were just hosting last October uh, a, a big round table in Vancouver at UBC's Robson Square uh, on uh, women's business growth. Um, jointly with the Sauter School, and uh, and it was excellent at, that to have the uh, Small Business Accelerator come out right after that. There's also the the Canadian Youth Business Foundation. There's uh, I don't know if SIFE is active on your campus, but that's another one. There's the uh, the organizations funded by Western Economic Diversification, in, including Small Business BC, Community Futures, and our own organization. So there's many resources you can tap into, and there's also things that you can do to help determine if you have those personality attributes that would make you a good entrepreneur. And I've, I've uh, brought a little self-assessment you can use that uh, we give out to students, college students and university students when we go to their events. If you want to fill in the self-assessment yourself and to inspire you to continue in your entrepreneurial journey, we've uh, got some, some uh, fridge magnets with some inspiring messages for you as well. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope you found it useful and uh, look forward to hearing the other speakers. Noreen assists small and large companies with business strategies, marketing plans, new product launches and customer service. Other projects have included the editing of a book on stress management and creating a guidebook on career development. Noreen has previously worked at Telus Mobility Brinkman and Associates Reforestation, Canadian Forest Products, Deloitte & Touche, and Regis McKenna. She is an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, a Bachelor of Mathematics from the University of Waterloo, and a Certified Management Consultant designation. Tonight, Noreen will offer practical insights and tips for the effective marketing and delivery of customer services and products. Please join me in welcoming Noreen Webster. So I'm glad to be here tonight. In July, I received an email, and uh, in the middle of my golfing series of golfing games, I'm a new golfer. I sort of looked at it and looked at this topic of, you know, small businesses and enterprises. Um, a, a forum in October. I kind of looked at it and thought, oh, we'll think about that later. Then in August, I was kind of going through my email, and I came up against this email again, and I thought, oh, this is really an interesting topic. There's, there's a lot of need in this area. And then I looked at what my background was, and I thought, marketing, services, marketing, services, and I thought, you know, this might be an interesting fit. So I sent an email off to Aaliyah, and, uh, and then when she said, yeah, we like that idea, um, next thing you know, here I am. So I'm glad to be here. And I hope that some of the comments that I give, which are essentially some suggestions on how to improve your marketing efforts, and this is guerrilla-style marketing for small businesses and entrepreneurs that doesn't take a lot of money and effort. Uh, hopefully that this will be useful for you. Okay, so, get my notes. So this is the agenda, the topics that I'll cover today, and in truth, everything I want to say is summed up in the first line, focus on your customer. So in the first, pit, first part, what I'll talk about is why focusing on your customer is so important, and then the last four um, areas are really some suggestions of what you might do in this area. So marketing. From working with a wide range of companies, I have, in helping them develop plans and strategies, I've come to realize that um, people don't understand the full scope of what marketing can do to them and what really good marketing is all about. So every business needs to do marketing, and when they prepare their initial business plan, 
they do a pretty good job. But ongoing, they don't think about marketing. They think about marketing as sales or advertising. But marketing is neither of those. Marketing is about finding about who your customer is, what they need, and then figuring out how you can deliver and, and help turn them into a satisfied, loyal customer. And so that's what's really important. So it's neither of those, but this is what, my, what I use as my sort of benchmark or the kind of marketing that I would like companies to achieve. And it is an, it's a definition by Peter Drucker. Those of you might know who Peter Drucker is. Um, but it's the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well that the product or service fits him or her and sells itself. It should result in a customer who is ready to buy and it all it is, is all, it's only necessary to make the product or service available to them. It's a pretty high standard and my question would be to all these small, uh, small entrepreneurs and businesses, in fact big businesses, does their marketing do this for them? If not, they could improve it. So when I talk about marketing, it all centers around customers. Customers must be happy customers. Happy, in my definition, is satisfied and loyal. When they're satisfied and loyal, that means they're repeat customers. And they will tell others about you and say, hey, if you need this done, you should go to this person. That's what you want as a customer. When you have satisfied customers, it drives your business success. I mean, it's, it's just a one-two combination that you can't beat. But also realize that most business owners, small business owners and entrepreneurs ultimately have other people that are working with them. And it just can't be one person believing in marketing. It has to be the whole team. And so everyone in a business, whether they're the ones that are directly facing the customers every day or whether they're in the back room working, they still have to have that, that experience and that attitude that satisfying the customer is really, really important. So last year, following this, this, along this top, I, I was teaching a class in specifically in services marketing, and it just so happened that the MSA gala event was um, that the the MSA student association put on was honoring Greg Soretsky with the CEO of WestJet, and it was quite fortunate that in his talk he talked about happy customers come from happy employees. And so his, his whole thing was about making sure that his employees were happy because when they were happy, they, did, they went up and above and beyond in making their customers happy. And you know, there's a lot of very loyal and very satisfied WestJet flyers. So as I say, when he was talking about it, he was talking about the baggage handlers, the maintenance men. He said they're all involved in satisfying customers. It's not just the flight attendants and the CSRs that answer the telephone. So it's a simple concept, you know, get happy customers, yields business success, but you have to understand what your customers need. So let's also look at satisfaction. So Customers say, oh, well, we've got to have satisfied customers. Well, what does it mean? Well, they do research, and typically when you do research, you ask five questions. You, you ask a question, say, how satisfied are you? And they give you a range of answers from very unsatisfied to very, very satisfied. So that's pretty typical. But what you have to realize is that even if they're satisfied customers, they still might leave. In fact, there's a good possibility that they'll leave. And it's not because they're unsatisfied, it's just it may not be enough. Or they might want to try out a new location, or there's a price difference, or they want to just simply to try something new. And so they're not necessarily turned into loyal customers. So it's a fallacy to, when you do research to say, well, I've got satisfied customers. It takes more than that to have loyal customers. And when you have loyal, it takes more than just a smile and an efficient transaction. You need to go up above and beyond all the time. So to do that, you need to know what really will make them happy. So going back to it, customers, when you have customers around for a long time, they end up being more profitable. So I'm trying to make this point really strong that you have to have good loyal customers to be business success. So this chart comes from uh, a study 
think this is a Harvard Business School study. And it was a study done over seven years on 19 different service categories. And what they were able to show was that over seven years, the profits from long-term customers were significantly higher than those that left after just one, two, or three years. So, and seven isn't a magic number. I'm sure if they continued it, you know, they'd have more results. But the fact is, is that if a customer's been around for seven years, it means that they're, they've got some level of satisfaction and loyalty. But what, it happens, what happens on the bottom line is that, first of all, your costs of acquiring that new customer have been amortized over seven years, which is good. And long-term customers buy more and will tend, for convenience sake, to consolidate purchases with just one supplier that they can trust. So that's, they buy more. They also, with familiarity with your services, they know what to expect, and therefore they make less mistakes, and it's just that much easier to service them, which means your costs go down. So again, more profits. Finally, and hopefully the most important, is that they start, if they've been working with someone for a while, they'll recommend your customers to others, It'll recommend you to others. others. They'll say, well, who does that for you? And they say, well, so-and-so does, and I've been using them for seven years. Well, if you've been using the same service for seven years, it's a pretty good recommendation. So now we're at that question, finally, of what do customers need, want, and expect? Those are three distinct things. Customers come to you because they believe some way that you can meet their need. Now, when they come in the door, they may not actually tell you what they need. It's your job to figure it out. Most of their needs are not stated, and often they just, they're secrets. They won't tell you that I'm coming to you because so-and-so recommended and I, wanna, I want them to invite me to their party or whatever their needs are. There's a whole range of things that you don't actually need to know, but you need to know you need to find out as much as you can about their needs. You also, they also come to you because after, through some sort of decision-making process, which they're often not even conscious about, they believe that your solution will minimize their risk. So you didn't think risk and needs. Well, risk is the fact that they come in and, in fact, the service fails. Well, that's a risk to them. So they're hoping that it's not going to do it. So your pro your you're coming into you is, is they're hoping that it won't happen. They're hoping that they don't have extra costs um, or they're wasting their time or they're, you know, wasting their time. It just takes longer than they expected or a whole range of other side effects. So here you're trying to do is figure out what they need and figure out how, again, to minimize the risks. So when they come in with their needs, they have beliefs about what's possible. And how do they set those? Well, they have pretty good definitions of, have some idea of what the service could possibly do. They've probably seen some implicit or explicit advertising or promotion on your company, and there's word of mouth or their past experience. So they have a, they have a belief of what's possible, but the reality is they know that not every time will a, will a service company be able to deliver 100% of what they truly desire. So they actually have created what we would call a zone of tolerance and they also have defined the lowest level of service that they will say will meet their level of service. Below that they say the service is unacceptable. So there's actually a fairly broad zone here. Your job is to figure out what that is and make sure that you don't get to that lower level. So they recognize that situational factors will come into play, and they also realize that, you know, this is better than all, all the other alternatives. So they, they do have some flexibility in what, what they will expect. So coming into your shop or wherever you are, they have this perceived vision of what that service is. So it's all perceived. So their perceived vision plus the service, the, their perception of how well they've received the service during the service delivery process yields satisfaction. So you have to combine all three pieces. So how do we, what can we do about this? So now we know kind of the process. The reality is that marketing, good marketing, once they understand what a customer needs and wants, 
it is possible to shape their expectations and therefore their satisfaction. And this is not manipulating them, this is just giving them the information that they need at appropriate times so they know what to expect from you in the delivery of service. So, particularly with service, it's really difficult because a service is intangible. You don't, you can't taste it, feel it, touch it, smell it, whatever you, what's the fifth sense? I can't remember what it is. Hear it? Anyway, you don't know what a service is before you actually experience it. So it's really difficult to, to provide tangible marketing evidence because you, you, know, you can't give out samples, really. It becomes really difficult. So, but there are things you can do. It just makes it a little bit more challenging for your marketing team. So there are tangible things that you can promote. You can promote and set an expectation by your pricing. You can set your expectation by where you decide to locate your business. And that includes on the internet on how you set that up. It can be the positioning messages that you include with any kind of literature on your website. It can be giving, uh, providing tours, doing videos, um, giving people opportunities to see what's going on, um, testimonials from existing clients or references. Those all help. Other educational information so that they know exactly what the, what the steps are so they're, you know, not surprised, you know, part way through saying, oh, I didn't expect this. Um, and that happens. Also providing your own credentials to say, yeah, I know how to do this. Hey, even better, give them a guarantee. So all these things can be done up front before they even walk in the door. They can get that information and that can be used to a, set their level of expectation and make sure they know that, you know, these are my needs and my needs will be met. During the service, so they've now come in, they're now experiencing the service, they're experiencing your, your business office, the culture, the people, the service provider. All of those things, again, can help determine whether or not they will be satisfied or not. So simply, you know, walking in your business office where, you know, you're providing this, what's the decor, how friendly are the people, how efficient are they in doing things, how long do they have to wait, um, what do you have on your wall, what do the people dress like, all these things can also contribute to setting an expectation and then setting satisfaction levels. And again, these are all things that you control. Finally, the service is finished. And most people can say, you know, quite safely after they've had the service, yeah, I'm satisfied. But there's also sometimes, you just like it or don't like it. I mean, you get your hair cut, you either like it or you don't like it, right? You're satisfied or not. But there's some services that you provide and they really don't know whether or not, you know, it was the best possible service they could get. So there again, there are things that you can do to add credence to your, what you've delivered. So you can also, um, in those cases, you can um, give them follow-up calls to make sure that they uh, understand it. Um, but most importantly, give them confidence during the delivery process that everything was done correctly and, and so they would be satisfied. Does this start to make, make sense, hopefully? So. Part of delivering the services is, is around designing the service so it works. So services are all about processes, people and processes. And the processes, um, the process tool that I've discovered that I really like is called either flowcharting or blueprinting, depending upon which level you want to get at. And what this does is that it allows you to drill down into the various steps of the service. And as you drill down and talk about each of those services, you're able to find out what is required to accomplish each of those steps. So what information has to be there, who has to be there, you know, what's going on at that step. When you know that step, you also can figure out, well, if those don't happen, these could be what I would call OTSU, opportunities to screw up. So by understanding the steps, you can also find the opportunities that you're gonna fail. So just as a simple example, you have to realize that you have to do this for every service that you provide. 
Okay, so if you're renting a car, there's a very different service process from the actual rental to the return. They're very different processes and very different expectations. So you have, would have to blueprint or flowchart both of those. So for my example of the car rental, there's five steps. You make your reservation, you go to the place, you get your car, pick it up, you do the paperwork, you inspect the car to make sure that it's what you expected, and then you drive away. Pretty simple. However, a company that really wants to do well in this, such as an example that I have for one of my textbooks, <laughs> one of the major rental car companies took this simple five-step process and expanded it into over 200 different points. So in, in those 200 points, they were able to very clearly define scripts for people to use. They could find out where there could be problems and eliminate those by fixing the process somewhere back and forth. They knew exactly what information needed to be there and what had to be done at each step along the way to eliminate the problems. Anyway, very useful tool. The other part of this tool is that you can distinguish clearly between the front stage and the back stage activities. In every business, there's those that deliver. They're, they're the front-facing people. They're the ones that handle customers all the time. But their work is supported by a whole bunch of people whose work is just as important, but they're behind the scenes. So theater is a great example. You know, It doesn't matter how great the guy is on stage. If the makeup person didn't do their job, it's not going to work. The costume person, the lighting people, it all works together. So what's important in doing the flow charting is that these steps you're able to identify what the front facing people need to do but you're also able to identify what needs to be done at the back end to be able to allow those people to do their job so it's kind of a complementary thing so it's how the people are supported so this opportunity to screw up OTSUs <laughs> so their fail points and wait times those can both be factors that cause people to say hmm I'm not satisfied Failure, of course, is it just doesn't work. It didn't work. And it makes people unhappy and customers unhappy. Your employees are unhappy. Everybody's unhappy. And when a failure occurs, then delays occur. So you need to figure out what those fails points are and either eliminate them or figure out a contingency to fix the problem on the fly. We, and we know that things are going to happen. Same with waiting times. We know that there can be waits between the delivery of service. You go into a restaurant, you sit down and have drinks, or you deliver, your, put your coat, and they say, well, it'll be five minutes for your table. Well, five minutes is one thing, but, you know, what's acceptable? 20 minutes is acceptable? No, 20 minutes isn't acceptable. So these are all opportunities to screw, to screw up. The reality is, is that people are pretty forgiving. They really are forgiving, and it, particularly if you go out of your way and acknowledge that there was a problem, and then say, hey, what can we do to fix it? And in fact, fixing problems is what makes the most loyal, pro loyal customers. So if you've done something that has said, hey, you know, they messed up, but look what they did for me, and it doesn't have to be something huge, that makes them loyal. So ask customers for feedback. Again, timing is important. We've all gone through the grocery checkout when somebody said, and did you find everything you needed today? Well, now you're in a rush to get out to your next appointment, and there's people in line. You're not going to say, well, I didn't find this, this, and this. It's, timing is off. Not very good. Surveys to take home, again, semi-useful. What I'm suggesting is consider alternative approaches, like setting up an appointment with a key customer. This is really useful for a small businessman or an entrepreneur because you don't have that many customers. You've got to build a relationship with them. So you say, hey, I need to pick your brain. Can we have a call? You can meet them one-on-one -on -one for a coffee or get a few people in a room and, and explore a problem so that you can really understand the why. The second part is the need to ask the right questions, because some people ask too broad of a questions, but if you ask them something specific that they can respond to, then you're going to get a better answer. So if you say, well, we're thinking about changing this process a little bit, you know, how might that affect you? What, what would you suggest that could make it better? They can dive into something like that, and they will give you really, really valuable feedback. So you just have to ask for it in the right way. Truth is, companies like GE are known for innovation. 
uh, 3M, all these companies, they state very clearly that their best ideas, their new best improvements, their new products, their new services, all come from ideas that they have received from customers. The best ones come from their customers. So don't be afraid to ask. So finally, it's references. Create reference customers. And this is actually going and telling a customer at the beginning, or asking them, I guess, it's not telling them, saying, asking them, saying, I would like you to become my reference customer. And in doing that, what happens is that the customer says, oh, this, I'm important to you, which they are. And if they agree to be your reference customer, they don't want to be called at a time and have to give bad news about you. So they're actually buying in to helping you make sure that everything that you do works for them. So they will ensure they're satisfied. You know, if you've asked them to be a reference customer, they'll say, you know, last time we did this, you know, it wasn't quite right. And so, you know, you got to fix this if you want me to continue to be your reference customer. So you're buying in and creating a relationship. And it's those reference customers that are absolutely critical to building up your business and to continuing on your business. So, as I say, you could actually make every customer reference customer. This doesn't have to be just one or two people. But that, that relationship, knowing that you're important, really does make a difference. Anyway, I'm over time. I don't like doing that. I have a class that usually gets jostling their books when it's pushing this time, my time frame. So I know when it's time very clearly. But just to recap, this is, this is what I covered. Focus on your customer. Discover what your, your customers want and expect and need. And just ask them, observe them, figure it out. And recognize, remember that they'll change over time, so this is an ongoing process. You've got to design your services from their perspective to find out where, what you need to deliver those services and to eliminate the opportunities to screw up. Ask for feedback and ask for references. That's it. Okay, our next speaker is Scott Coleman. Uh, Scott's a lifetime sport devotee. Originally from Red Deer, Alberta, he's made Kelowna his home and has offered his unique training styles and concepts to numerous athletes in the Valley. Scott's background is most strongly represented by hockey, where he was fortunate enough to compete at the Junior A level in the Alberta Junior Hockey League and the Ontario Hockey Association. After competing, Scott focused on the development of elite athletes, as well as aiding in functional fitness practices for the public. This past June, he teamed up with another local trainer and started the company FunCore Strength and Conditioning. FunCore has seen steady growth throughout its first year and continues to expand throughout the Okanagan Valley. Most recently, the company successfully ran an eight-week summer training program for elite hockey players in Vernon, Kelowna, and West Bank. Presently, Scott attends UBC's Okanagan campus and is in his final year of a Bachelor of Management degree. Outside of school, he serves as a strength and conditioning specialist with the Vernon Viper Junior A hockey team and also works with various clientele and facilities throughout Kelowna. Scott's going to share some practical tips and lessons learned from his recent startup experience. Please join me in welcoming Scott Coleman. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd really like to thank uh, Laurel and Noreen for an amazing couple of presentations. That uh, was really impressive. So if we get one more round of applause for those guys. Uh, getting into this tonight was really interesting. Uh, Noreen approached me and asked if, uh, if I knew anything about this, if, if this would be appropriate. And I thought, no, I don't have no idea what it is. So <laughs> send an email and next thing you know, I was, uh, I was asked to come and speak tonight. So. Um, I really thank the SBA for giving me this opportunity. So yeah, FunCore Strength Conditioning uh, was something that kind of came together sort of sporadically and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to tell you more about that. So first, uh, yeah, I am Scott Coleman uh, from Red Deer, Alberta. Uh, I've been in a lot of places, but uh, in Okanagan for about uh, two and a half years now and I played a lot of years of hockey and, and, and got comfortable. With, uh, with, with that style of training and, and, and the type of lifestyle that it offered. Um, uh, I'm very passionate for not just hockey, but other sports as well, and I wanted to offer those style of training concepts to basically anyone who was up for the challenge. My experiences came through a lot of different uh, avenues. 
Uh, CanPro Athletic Training Center was the first, the first place that, uh, that I started to gain my experience in the training industry. They were extremely helpful. They were very, very supportive. And uh, a man by the name of Al Prada, who started the company, got me started with the Red Deer Rebels, where I conducted a lot of fitness testing, worked with their injured players, and also uh, contributed to their athletic development as well. From there, I got involved with Red Deer Minor Hockey all through CanPro. And then it brought me to Kelowna, where I was uh, fortunate enough to get involved with Twist Conditioning. Uh, Twist Conditioning was an absolutely phenomenal training brand, and it uh, taught me a lot of the different styles of training concepts and how to use the body that I use today. Um, the next level was the facility that uh, Twist operated out of. It was a massive facility, and um, we got a lot of great opportunities out of that place that I really appreciated. As of now, I do a lot of my work out of Body Fit, which is on the west side. They offer a really unique space, which is uh, comfortable for my style of training. And um, if anyone in here is into that kind of thing, please come and see me. So the idea for Fun Core Strength Conditioning. This, this, this concept really came together because I wanted to use the tools and uh, the experience that I gained through uh, the, the previous years of training to really build something different, to offer a different style of training where you couldn't get anywhere else. I felt that Twist was a big provider with that and I wanted to use those concepts that I got from their brand, uh, tie it into what I had learned and make a superior program. Um, I wanted to challenge, challenge the norms of traditional training, beat them, I wanted to be above that and uh, although you never knock down your opponent, uh, especially a, di a different brand, you want to be able to have a superior product. Kelowna became home. Uh, I met someone here that inspired me very much. Uh, she was a, a big part of me starting this company, and she'd probably kill me if I mentioned her name, but uh, she was great, and I wanted to definitely be here for that and uh, move forward in Kelowna. The first steps to starting this company, um, first of all, I got involved with uh, an, an amazing trainer who actually has a lot more experience than I do and a lot more education. Uh, he was extremely helpful in, in, uh, in getting me started, and I guess I was really lucky to have the opportunity to work with him uh, he preferred to be anonymous uh, for this presentation, but I can tell you that a lot of the, a lot of the steps I took in starting this business I gained from him. Um, I wanted it to be sports specific. So in moving forward, we, we wanted to establish different styles of training that, that weren't seen in many places. We wanted to excite people because we knew that we had established clientele, but to build on that clientele, we'd have to offer some sort of unique training concept that uh, a, a lot of people haven't seen, especially seeing that Kelowna is a, is a city where there's numerous avenues for, for training, trainers, working out. It's a beach city. Everyone wants to have a washboard stomach. Um, we wanted to understand the, co the competition, so we took the time in understanding that and, and uh, we, we took that into account. The first thing we did, get a small business license, and I want to tell you a little bit about the insurance for this style of stuff. Here I was thinking that I'd be able to look at the same sort of premium that I'd get with my car insurance. Wow, that was wrong. Um, the first quote I got was actually $2,800 for eight weeks of training. That was pretty astronomical, but then um, we started to understand that there's risk to neck injuries, heads, joints, all the fun stuff. So to have insurance to run this sort of an operation, we had to pay a high premium. Although we got it knocked down, it still wasn't cheap. Escalate Performance was uh, my contribution to the business. I brought this in, uh, tying in once again my different experiences in training, and this is what I really wanted to do for Fun Core Strength Conditioning. And at the time, I didn't feel Fun Core Strength Conditioning was the type of name that was going to attract the style of clientele I wanted. So building Escalate, um, I spent a lot of time developing different programs. Uh, you know, it's, it, it wasn't easy with school sometimes, and uh, my grades definitely suffered, but uh, uh, I guess I kind of like the challenge of, uh, of taking on too much at once, and, you know, that's, uh, that's something I guess I got to work on. But uh, we wanted to develop the athlete in a unique way, and we wanted to develop seasonal, uh, seasonal aspects and put it all together into a, a really different program. FunCore actually came together for one side sport and then one side working with clients on their docks, uh, in their homes, basically outside a facility where people can get a natural style of exercise. My marketing efforts, our marketing efforts, I should never say mine in this concept, um, we had a large customer, customer base. We had established clientele because both my partner and I had worked in the industry for a lot of years. So we had a lot, of, a lot of people that were excited to get involved with our, uh, with our business. 
Um, we were represented through Kelowna, Lake Country, and Vernon. Um, for myself, Lake Country and Vernon was my biggest draw as working with the, the next level, which is actually right near the campus up here. Um, we had a lot of people come from Vernon to come in and check us out. We needed to use outside sources for reference. So like uh, Noreen mentioned, having that reference factor with your customers was extremely important. And uh, developing the relationships I had through the businesses and the, over the years really, really was beneficial in getting started. When, uh, when sitting down and looking at everything, we needed help. We didn't have a lot of us, a lot of startup costs to do something crazy with the marketing. So we spent countless hours on the phones and meetings, sending emails. And, uh, and doing everything we can to get the word out about Escalate Performance and Fun Core Strength Conditioning. I wanted to share a little story with you. The facility fiasco. This was probably one of the most stressful things I've ever been through in my life. <laughs> we had put this, uh, this entire program together. We had started to accept money from people and we had, we had gotten going. And uh, I had not secured the proper facility. The next level closed its doors. Um, and we didn't have anything to work with. So, for it was a, a good two weeks, two, two to three weeks of panic, and uh, cooler heads did prevail. We eventually established two facilities in which we could do the training program out of, and they were CrossFit Glenmore and Cal Fitness of Vernon. So, with CrossFit Glenmore, I'm not going to say the name too much more, I'm just going to give you the address which is at the bottom there, because the owner's a really big stickler for, it's not CrossFit that I'm doing, I'm just renting his space. So that's kind of what this whole training program worked through, um, which was originally designed for 10 weeks, by the way. Um, we, we needed st certain styles of equipment, and obviously we didn't have the money to get something started like that. So by renting, uh, renting space and renting the equipment within those areas, we were able to generate a, a larger amount of profit in a smaller amount of time. Plus, <laughs> this, the, with, with athletic training, especially in the hockey department, the, the window is so small because the off season's not that long, and you don't have a lot of time to do a lot of things. So you needed a, an established facility with the proper equipment to get started. Um, Cal Fitness kind of came to my attention a lot later as uh, I had a strong number of Vernon athletes that were not wanting to make the drive into Cologne every day. So instead, I had agreed to make the drive every day myself. Um, a, lot of, a lot of kilometers, but uh, in the end, it was definitely worth it. So this was the program breakdown. Groups of four to six athletes, no more, no less. Because um, if, we if we were less than four, we weren't, it didn't make any sense, it wouldn't work. And then uh, if we were above six, we couldn't give the proper attention to the athlete that they deserve. Um, we worked Monday to Friday, uh, one to five hours, uh, or 1.5 hour uh, training sessions that were, that were very, very comprehensive and, and ongoing. We never really stopped, not even for water. Well, you can have a little bit of water, I suppose. And then in August, we started with three-day-a-week ice as well. So we tied in a fully comprehensive program with proper periodization, and um, we had nothing but great results. So I wanted to tie in this really quick, my summer schedule, uh, just based on the fact that any person that thinks they can get involved in a, in a small business and, you know, they're a boss now and they don't have to work that hard, you're insane. I've never had to work so hard in my life. The countless hours I had to put in, I was up at 5 a.m. every morning driving to Vernon and getting home 8.30, 8 in the evening. Now, I'm not saying that people can't do it, and, and, uh, and, and I'm not saying that's not possible. However, you definitely need to be dedicated. And to, and to be successful in your, in your first year, you're going to have to work harder than you've ever worked before. So the lessons and takeaways from this venture, establish your location far before you ever accept any money because uh, I definitely put myself in a difficult position, so get it in writing. Seek aid from a business consultant and use the advice wisely. Laurel spoke tonight and uh, I know that she's helped a lot of people get started with that sort of thing. My, um, my person was uh, Sam Mowat and he works for Progressive Business Solutions out of Vernon and he was extremely, extremely helpful in making me understand the style of things that I needed to know moving into this. Establish meaningful relationships through the process. So, if you want your business to grow, you have to retain those customers, much like Noreen uh, just explained, so I won't get too much into it. But having those relationships, there, people are going to come back if you do a good job. That's why we had the clientele to get started, because we did a good job with them before. You need to be a true believer in your brand. You can never knock your own brand down. You need to be very, very, uh, you, have to, you have to be a big stickler on this sort of thing. And what's extremely important is that you never knock down another brand, because that 
you know, kind of hacks at your credibility a little bit. And the last and most important thing is you need to deliver on your promises. If you tell somebody you can do something, you need to come through. Because if you don't, they're gone. Enjoy the ride. It's an absolute blast. So where am I going from here? Where does the business go? I found this image today. And um, I, I, I thought it was absolutely appropriate for this style of thing. I may not be there yet, but I'm closer than I was yesterday. I don't have an answer for where the company's going for now, but we are seeing steady growth. There are people asking why we're not still going, and uh, we're just sort of in a little bit of a, say, well, mute stage right now because school's busy, my partner's busy, and, you know, we'll get back into it when the time's right. So a few final words to leave you with. Challenge your limits. Don't limit your challenges. There's nothing out there that you can't do, and businesses grow. And then these were the words that my father gave me, uh, win, which stands for what's important now. Thanks.